to close out the topic on asynchronous IO, we'll talk just for a minute about your design choices in terms of building a server if you were trying to do concurrent socket IO, keeping in mind also that eventually at some low level, uh, if you're doing something with um, web requests, we are relying on underlying sockets for this kind of thing. Uh, in any case, um, there are four choices really that we could talk about and you can mix and match uh, as, as you need. Uh, and the first one is blocking I.O. one process per request. Um, the next is blocking I.O. one thread per request. Uh, and then we have asynchronous I.O. with a pool of threads and there's callbacks where each thread is handling multiple connections. Uh, and then there's non-blocking I.O. with pool of threads, multiplex with select and pull, event driven, that sort of thing. Each thread having multiple kinds of connections. Uh, and we'll talk about them at least a, a little bit in the tiniest amount of detail. The first model is blocking IO one process per request. This is the Apache model, uh, you know, the uh, ancient, uh, if you were building a web server long ago, kind of thinking this is how you would do it. Uh, and it is, well, you know, not recommended anymore, honestly, but um, you know, there's reasons why it was chosen uh, in its time. So one thing um, that it does, um, we have a main thread, it waits for connections. When we get uh, a new connection request, um, fork a new process, uh, and that new process is responsible for handling that uh, incoming request uh, all the way from start to finish. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, then it, the process can exit. Uh, each I.O. request is blocking, reads wait until more data arrives, uh, and you know, it's simple to understand, it's easy to program, um, but there is very high overhead from starting lots and lots of processes. Um, this eventually will no longer scale uh, because uh, there are usually limits on how many processes you can uh, you can spawn. Uh, and if you've seen previously a demonstration about how many threads you can make, it's quite large for a uh, for a Unix system, but the number of processes uh, can eventually uh, run out if you have too many of them and it runs out much much quicker than the number of threads would run out so it's not an ideal plan uh, although it can work um, at, a, at a low level this was done in the old Apache model because this is you know the best that people knew to do at the time not because it's necessarily the best overall uh, then going to one thread per uh, request uh, works better because uh, it's the same as one uh, process basically but there is less overhead um, it is still simple to understand and relatively easy to program uh, but it does have a couple of potential problems one being there's still overhead uh, although not as much as processes uh, but we face the possibility of having race conditions on shared data and you know, coordinating all of those different threads um, IO is still blocking and that's a reasonable approach uh, the asynchronous I.O. Um, using some very old data from 2006, but just giving you uh, an idea of the kind of difference um, when we uh, work using asynchronous I.O. Uh, is we're now uh, multiplexing threads to connections. The idea being that um, network communication is slow and you could spend a lot of time waiting. And in the meantime, a thread could be serving multiple incoming connections. So you got a request, please fetch me invoices from the database. Okay, then you request stuff from the database, but you got to wait for the database server to respond to you. Uh, and in the meantime, you could handle another incoming connection. Maybe it's the health check and respond to that uh, all while you're waiting for the database. Sounds okay. Um, in any case, the uh, asynchronous I.O. approach is rather efficient because it uh, relieves some of the uh, data uh, relieve some of the uh, stress that's put on your system by having fewer threads and allowing threads that are otherwise not busy to uh, move around and do what they need to do uh, and uh, reduces the data that's being swapped from thread contexts because there is a non-zero cost to swapping between threads and running the scheduler and all that sort of thing. Um, and then there is the select or poll workflow in which you enqueue a request, do something else, uh, you know, periodically check whether a request is done, and then read return values uh, if that's what you want to do. 
there's a great deal more information about how select and poll do what they do uh, in the EC252 notes if you're interested in learning. Um, both select and poll are kind of considered not great practice anymore because there are better tools to do what you want to do. LibEvent probably is available on a Unix-like system or Windows, uh, and ePoll is a somewhat better implementation than poll. Uh, but there are a lot of systems that still use select and poll. Um, but in either case, what you're doing is you know, starting things and then you wait for sockets to be ready. It's you know, complicated and arcane. There, there's a reason why in uh, the discussion about using select uh, with curl, I said don't do it. Uh, so with uh, these tools in hand, um, I, we're going to um, take a little bit of a step back next time uh, and start to work on the hardware stuff. Now that we have a good understanding of Rust uh, as well as you know, asynchronous I.O. and hopefully bring with you some previous experience in threads and processes and you know, reading and writing files and what have you, uh, it's enough to get started in working on different problems that you're going to uh, work on in the language and do some assignments perhaps. Uh, and uh, now we'll step back and look into some hardware stuff and find out why do certain things make your program slow and why does it matter? <laughs>